All right, so welcome to day two of the webinar um, on theater performance in foreign and performance in foreign language education, um, which is being hosted by the Global Languages Center, OP Jindal Global University. It is the 27th of March today, which is incidentally also celebrated as the World's Theater Day. What a delightful coincidence, isn't it? Um, before we proceed to the next talk of this webinar today, I'd like to briefly summarize for all those of you who've joined us only today, uh, what was discussed yesterday. Hmm? So we had this lovely talk on foreign languages, theater and understanding oneself by Dr. Milind Brahme from IIT Madras. So in his talk, Dr. Milind Brahme meticulously drew a connection between the critical discourse in theater and in foreign language education. He undertook an analysis of the different theatrical styles of two very important modern playwrights from the German speaking world, Bertolt Brecht and Erden von Horvath. From his analysis, he arrived at certain important conclusions regarding the notion of the self and the other that can be transferred to the context of the foreign language education. We learned about the prevailing conditions of their times. We learned how both the playwrights were responding to the rampant social political violence of their times. It was a time of turmoil. So it was not essentially a difference in cause, but rather, as I've understood, a difference of style of representations where they varied from each other. For Brecht, now I'm rec recalling all that was um, but all that we learned from, from Dr. Brahmi's presentation yesterday, for Brecht, art has clearly not the function of merely satisfying the habits of the audience, but to change them. In order to achieve this, he tried out new techniques to work on the consciousness of the public, to modify its consciousness in the spirit of, as Milan put it, salvaging reason, to discover social causalities and bring about demystification. Horvath, Erden von Horvath, too, believed in freeing the audience from kitschy sentimentality and their stupidity, dummheit. Heimatlosigkeit, or homelessness, was what Horvath preferred to the increasingly proud bantering about the nation, the nationhood. However, unlike Brecht's more direct style, Horvath used irony and satire in unmasking in the unmasking of the false consciousness of his figures. His characters have a conf confused language and show contradictions of consciousness. This had to do with Horvath's profound skepticism concerning the ability of language to reflect reality accurately. He felt that linguistic forms depend on human perception and may even falsify the reality that one perceives. And we discussed the example of their Ewige Spieße in this context. And then the question arose, how can these inputs from the world of theater, I, this, this is a very critical um, discourse here in the theater, be transferred to the learning and teaching of a foreign language? By analyzing the thinking styles of the playwrights, one arrived at the conclusion that it is, it is essential to make our students critically aware of their use of language in a particular context. As a teacher of a foreign language, it is therefore imperative to enable the learners to become aware of their own perceptions of things, to critically differentiate between what they see as their own and what they perceive as the other. Learning a foreign language entails learning to reflect on the world and ourselves through the lens of another language and culture, Dr. Brahmi said. This can be achieved through performances, through simulations, and critically analyzing and comparing the given foreign context with the student's immediate contexts. We also talked about the, the importance of practicing here. Horvath's idea of homelessness reflects what I would call a resistance towards the politics of identity building. In the context of learning this, um, uh, of, of learning, this could be interpreted as an openness to learning. Going performative, and this was, so to say, the last um, um, 
uh, last point in uh, Professor uh, Dr. Milin's uh, Milin Bami's uh, slide, where he said, "Going performative implies a willingness to step out of our of our taken for granted selves and open ourselves to the other." Well, and that serves as the perfect bridge to our next talk that will be delivered by Professor Manfred Shaver, who will be speaking on the topic, going performative in language education. And to chair the session, we have with us Professor Madhu Sani from the Center of German Studies, GNU. Let me introduce my dear Madhu to all of you. Professor Madhu Sani has been teaching at the JNU at the Jawaharlal Nehru University since 1984. Her research interests include feminist literary studies, literary translation, and critical language pedagogy. In 2000, she, she published Zum Geschichtsverständnis Heinrich Manns in seiner essayistischen Arbeit 1905 bis 1955. She edited also, she edited the Goethe Society of India yearbook between 2012 and 2015, and has also, along with Namita Khare, edited an anthology of translated texts from German into Hindi. Uh, the name of the text is Ek Ajnabise Mulakat, German Bhashi Stri Lekhan. Well, but that was the formal introduction, you know. I know Madhu as a student. And apart from being a serious academician, Professor Madhu Sani has always committed herself to being what I call a student's teacher. Being such a teacher, she has always diligently and painstakingly, she used to, well, she, she says she doesn't do that anymore. She used to painstakingly organize student festivals in order to promote an experience of holistic learning experience for among students. And she had, has been a strong proponent of the importance of performance in learning German as a foreign language and in the context, in the larger context of German studies. So I welcome you, dear Madhu, and over to you. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Yes, I don't do it anymore, but that's where I encountered Professor Shevi the first time. Because my first encounter with understanding that perform uh, theater, theater activities are so important for language learning is when I realized that, um, you know, the students were not particularly enthusiastic anymore about, you know, German language, about this, that, and the other. And also, I used to be convinced in those years that the main thing that we had to do at the university when we were going to train students of Germanistic was either to learn to write very well. And they would keep emphasizing oral skills, oral skills. So very spontaneously, I said, okay, let's do a play. So that's how it started. I had absolutely no background on theater pedagogy, nothing. It was something that just came out of nowhere. Now, I couldn't sing. That was my tragedy in that sense. If I could sing, I would have talked up songs like a teacher of mine, Professor R.P. Jen, it's, but unfortunately, I can sing. So intonation, all these things were important. So we started and we did the play Develer. I think today Om Prakash is there. He was part of that group, that first group which I did theater with. It took us a year that time. After that, it became a semester thing. And then that's when I started reading. You know, up till then I'd never read really. And you know, I never liked the dialogues in the books ever, in the lab in the course books. They were really kind of, they didn't fit in with the way our students studied in school and then came to university. Because I'm talking about undergraduates. So then I started reading and of course I read Professor Shave's work, you know, Susanna Avon. A lot of people one started looking at. I also looked at the area of English language teaching and then we did another play, Diffusica, in another group. And then we did another Mayashin for Virum or something like that it was called. And then eventually we also started writing our own plays. Not me, I have to admit. That was two other colleagues who were teaching with me. They, along with the students, wrote a play. And that went off quite well, too. Eventually, doing the play was not always possible. But what was possible was theater exercises. And that was really wonderful. So I'm really, really honored to be introducing Professor Manfred Shaver here today and I'm looking so forward to his talk. He's Professor Emeritus from the University College of Cork at Cork. He was the head of the department of both the German and theater departments. His work, as we already understand, is interdisciplinary and 
focuses on the performative approach to language, literature, and culture. In 2007, Professor Shewe established an online journal called Scenario, which focuses on performative teaching, learning, and research. And in 2012, the Scenario book series was started, whose goal is it is to promote intercultural dialogue in the area of drama and theater pedagogy. And recently, and I mean, I, we really have to look at that book, uh, he has edited a volume called Einonazi Sprüche zu Enter to Unsere Welt on the softening of our world, 81 sayings. I think that must be quite an interesting collection, 81 sayings. Today, he will be talking to, as Shruti just told us, on going performative in language education, where he will be addressing issues like what it, all, it means, you were, at all I was going to say about, what it means, what you mean by performative, and specifically in language education, the various performative approaches that have appe uh, appeared over the years, over the ages or, or actually, as part of language education, he will also be talking to us about the scenario project. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shruti, for organizing this absolutely wonderful sessions. And I mean, I've really enjoyed. That's why I jumped out of the other seminar and came here. <laughs> thank you so much. Over to you now, Professor Shruti. <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Professor Madhu Zani. And thank you very much, Dr. Shruti Jain, for organizing this very impressive event. Thank you for the kind introduction, which is much appreciated. Can I just check, can you hear me okay? Is it, is it, yeah? It's viel zu leise. Viel zu leise, okay. Mm -hmm. So much, I need to go nearer to the microphone maybe, is this better? Slightly, uh, what about the others? Can, yeah, it could be better, it could get better. Yeah, okay, so, mm -hmm. Uh, what about now? Is this uh, more yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So thank you very much indeed for the wonderful introduction, Professor Madhusani and Dr. Shruti Jay for the impressive event. I feel very honored to be part of this uh, gathering of like-minded people. And uh, I got the sense yesterday already and get the sense again, you're all very experienced in the field. So I'm not too sure what I can offer you today, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a bit of a try. Hmm? So before I do so, I wish to thank the presenters of yesterday. So who offered a fascinating panorama of the different stages of development of German theater. So there was quite an emphasis on professional theater. And uh, today I will shift the emphasis a bit more to the educational side. So I hope that is okay. So again, uh, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Shruti Jain also for participating on a regular basis in the Scenario Colloquium. Your active involvement is very much appreciated and to you know, discuss performative matters with Indian colleagues is uh, a great experience for me. I wish to also say a special hello to Jan Helge Weidemann, hmm? DRD lector. As I started off as a DRD lecturer, that's how I got into all of this. And uh, so it's wonderful to collect with all of you in India. I visited Bangalore twice and continue to be impressed by the cultural riches of India. So I guess uh, I will have to set up a PowerPoint if that's all right. So my intention is to work myself through the PowerPoints. However, we can stop at any point. I don't have to go slavishly through the PowerPoints. So I'm, I'm very flexible in, in that way. Um, so I'll try my best to do that. I'm not an IT wizard, but I hope this uh, will work now soon. Just a second. Hmm. Okay. Can that be seen? Yes. Yeah. It's yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, just uh, here you see my email, just in case you have a query later on. 
or wh whoever is interested in uh, my work, the details you find on my staff page. So I, I will begin by uh, the arts. Let me see now, how does this work? Okay. Yep. So, um, Jindal Global University. So I thought maybe it's good to start uh, globally and look at arts and education world congresses. So before we look at culturally specific and language specific contexts, let us begin by reminding everyone that there have been two UNESCO World Congresses that explicitly focused on the arts in education. The Congress in Lisbon, 2006, resulted in a roadmap for arts education. And the Congress in Seoul in, the, in 2010, in the so-called Seoul Agenda, Goals for the Development of Arts Education. So I guess we have to uh, situate ourselves, depending on where we are, hmm, uh, within the, this low, uh, global picture. Both these documents continue to be an important point of reference for anyone wishing to situate arts education in a broader international context. In the Roadmap for Arts Education, for example, it states, people in all cultures have always and will always seek answers to questions related to their existence. Every culture develops means through which the insights obtained through the search for understanding are shared and communicated. Basic elements of communication are words, movements, touch, sounds, rhythms, and images. In many cultures, the expressions which communicate insights and open up room for reflection in people's minds are called art. Throughout history, labels have been put on various types of art expressions. It is important to acknowledge the fact that even if terms like dance, music, drama, and poetry are used worldwide, the deeper meanings of such words differ between cultures. Thus, any list of arts fields must be seen as a pragmatic categorization, ever evolving and never exclusive. I think this take on the international pictures or intercultural picture is quite interesting. So whatever we do in the arts fields, so it's in constant development. In the medieval Western world, the following uh, counted among the respected Septem Artes Liberales, the seven liberal arts, rhetorics, grammar, dialectics, arithmetics, geometry, astronomy, and music. What this drawing reveals is that in the Middle Ages, there was no neat separation between science and art. An obvious example is the work of inventor Leonardo da Vinci, operating seamlessly across disciplines like botany, life drawing, cartography, engineering, painting, and beyond. However, by the 19th century, art and science had become distinct, as it is evident in Descartes' Discourse on Method and Meditations on First Philosophy. From there on, we have grown to consider art and science at the opposite sides of the spectrum of knowledge, a rather unproductive affair. Over the last two decades, 
I have argued on many occasions that the academic discipline, which focuses on the teaching and learning of foreign languages, which in German is called Fremdsprachendidaktik, should not continue to see itself as a scientific discipline, but also as an artistic discipline. So I hope it will become clearer later on what this means. I, I wish to go on a little bit with uh, uh, early connections between dramatic art, teaching, learning, and living. Sorry, I'm getting here a bit mixed up. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I think there's a little problem somewhere in the slides. I'd skip this one just to uh, expand on the idea I just hmm, tried to develop. Fremdsprachen didactic as an artistic discipline. So uh, foreign language teachers usually are being trained in a teacher training institution. And uh, it's often considered to be a scientific program they are going through, or in German anyway, you would call it a wissenschaftliche Ausbildung. So uh, the uh, slide here shows that then obviously you qualify as a teacher, as a pedagogue. What I'm trying to say here is that my vision would be that a teacher pedagogue over the years sees him or herself more and more as an artist. So, and this kind of little uh, representation here just shows that development for an individual is possible at any stage in his, her biographical hmm, career. Hmm. So I want to look next at what kind of performative approaches have found their way into language education in past decades and centuries. Obviously, I have to go through things here very fast. And uh, you see a link here, you can always hmm, go back to this article and uh, uh, check details. So I'll do a bit of an historical overview here. Beginning in the medieval times, the metaphor of the world as a stage, as in Latin teatrum mundi, tends to be associated in particular with the Spanish Baroque poet, Calderón de la Barca. I think I have a little slide here. Yep, there we go. In the first part of his famous play, El Gran Teatro del Mundo, God, the author speaks of the world as a wonderful, but in the end short-lived theater in which the drama of human life is acted out. The world actually becomes a character in the play. The play that the master wishes to see performed, the play of human life. The idea of life as a play, as well as the idea of understanding life better through play, has existed for quite some time in the history of European culture. Should you uh, begin to realize at this point that I'm obviously very influenced by European culture and I'm aware of all the cultural riches in India, but uh, uh, I'm afraid I come from this European perspective. So uh, 
please uh, yeah, bear, bear that in mind. Since ancient times, dramatic art has raised fundamental questions about both the limits and the possibilities of human existence and the possibilities of human existence and the possibilities of human existence. Just repeating this because what we are trying to do when we work with drama and theater, we try to explore these possibilities. The world looks kind of as it looks, but it could be very different. So, and drama gives us the opportunity to explore that more. In addition, there are also early indications of the roles dramatic art can play in the field of education in order to help individuals to come to a better understanding of what life is about and to develop abilities and skills which might be of value in the course of their education and personal development. The use of drama in educating children, for example, goes back to Plato. So 427 before Christ, he was born, who believed that children should learn in a playful way and be allowed to blossom by having as few constraints as possible on them. The philosopher Quintilian, sorry, <laughs> getting mixed up here with my screens. The philosopher Quintilian regarded actors as exemplars of the art of delivering speech. In the early Middle Ages, Benedictine monks began to accompany their singing of sacred hymns with gestures and movements, the first steps towards the emergence of religious plays. These plays aimed at educating people at a time when access to books and learning was reserved for the privileged classes of medieval society. The increasing use of drama-related activities in European schools towards the second half of the 16th century can be explained by the influence of humanist ideals of education. From 1560 onwards, for example, the performance of a play in Latin and English had become an annual event at the Westminster School. It was felt to provide a good training in appropriate behavior, proper action, and to help to polish the students' pronunciation skills. So that's a long time ago, not from 1560 onwards. Going to the German context, so I'm skipping over a few decades and centuries, talking of Goethe, for example. Goethe's father had a skeptical view of theater, but, but he came to you know, understand better later when he saw that his uh, son was involved in theater plays, what the value of that experience was. So uh, it says here in some secondary school uh, source that uh, Goethe's father found that it was teaching young Goethe to speak French faster than any tutor. It seems that this attitude was also shared by committed language teachers at English schools from the, sorry, I'm getting confused here by committed language teachers at English schools from the mid 19th century onwards. As in the Renaissance, the mid century schoolmasters first adopted drama as an aid to language study. French and German were beginning to enter the curriculum. And though they were often taught as dead languages, the more enlightened masters treated them as living and promoted the oral aspect of their teaching by stage performance. So we went through a few 
centuries here now, and obviously it's just a very brief overview. And we are entering the well, 20th century now, so I could go on with this overview, but it might be a bit tiresome and you can actually read up on this in the article I mentioned on this slide, which will be made accessible to you later on. I just want to keep it briefly here regarding the 20th century. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we have the so-called progressive movement in, in England. And so there are attempts being made to incorporate drama-related learning activities into the school curriculum. And just to give you an example, in 1911, for example, Dr. Rouse, a teacher in the Perth Grammar School in Cambridge wrote, acting is one of the most potent means of learning. Thought, word, and act linked together make an impression such as nothing else can make. In this direction lies the salvation of our schools. We all know how dull a textbook is. A history of English, a manual of grammar, even chemistry books are sometimes dull. But if the teacher uses his book as a suggestion, makes his history a story, sets his pupils to act it in make-believe, before they know what they are doing, they are practicing English composition and English grammar and learning English history. So 1911. So we could go further through the decades, but I just wish to leave it by saying that, especially in Great Britain, sort of drama-based teaching flourished in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I think then other countries sort of also began to embrace teaching through drama more. And I guess in the foreign language context, uh, a lot of uh, uh, pioneering work was done in German speaking countries. So just with regard to the British uh, landscape, I just want to point out the name, for example, of Gavin Bolton. His name is very much associated with the introduction of drama as a school subject or the introduction of drama as a teaching method. So teaching languages or other subjects through drama and also associated with the introduction of drama as a subdiscipline within the field of education. I continue with my slides here a little bit. So just uh, to say that yeah, some of you know that I retired a while ago, and I, I, I'm taking the opportunity today to, to look back a big bit and take stock. So I will uh, uh, talk about my personal experience in academia, hoping that by looking at my example, you will get an introduction to all kinds of you know, uh, facets of teaching and learning through drama. So in the introduction, reference was made already to interdisciplinary orientation in my work. So I worked in the Department of German and in the Department of Drama and Theatre Studies at University College Cork. And so obviously this has influenced me a lot hmm, that I have been sort of in between the disciplines or across the disciplines. Hmm, and uh, I'm enjoying that sort of experience until today. So I'm taking you through a, on, on a personal journey here. And hmm, you see that I did my teacher training in from 74 to 81 at Oldenburg University. And uh, 
so you see here on top wissenschaftliche Lehrerinnenausbildung. So in yellow, so scientific Lehrerinnenausbildung. A lot of emphasis was placed on the wissenschaftliche, scientific. So I didn't come across a lot of drama and theater in my studies, but towards the end of my studies, at least I came across the use of role play in uh, language teaching. I also became familiar with a South American theater director's work, Augusto Boal, for example, he's known for a form called the Invisible Theater. Here are some publications by him, which you might want to refer back to later on. So after my teacher training, so my first job took me to the University of Cork. And uh, so my, one of the first things I was asked to do was to direct a play for the German society. And uh, so you see here that I, I I, I directed my first play, Die Physica. It was mentioned earlier already, The Physicists. And uh, that was, I think, in 1982 or so, 83. And then later on, a year later, I did another play called Ein Fest by Papadakis. So basically, that experience, similar to no, what no, Madi Sani earlier said, I was thrown into the cold water there. I didn't have an awful lot of knowledge as to how to do it, but certainly the experience with the physicists was an important uh, point in my career because I began to really yeah, enjoy the experience of the yeah, collective work. Uh, and I learned from the first experience a lot in the sense that the physicists, when performed, was a two hour long play. And imagine that in the foreign language. So you can imagine maybe it was a bit of an imposition for, for the audience. So I learned from the experience and then actually began to read up a lot on theater and theater and education. And I came across the Grips Theater in Berlin. And this play here in Fest by Papadakis is by the Grips Theater. So the Grips Theater specializes on theater for children, for young people. And Irish students are kind of in between 17, 18 to 21 years old. So I think that was a much better experience in the end for me and a much better choice of play. And uh, both those involved, the actors and also the audience really appreciated this play particularly. So my personal journey goes on. Uh, just, I'm just pausing for a second because I, I don't see anyone on, this, on, 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 on my screen here, which is confusing me a bit. So it would be better if I got the image back and I'm not sure exactly what to do here. Is there any advice? Um, probably you have to end the presentation just for a moment. You can start it from that slide later on, but I think first you have to uh, end it, then you can see the option to stop sharing. Yes. Will I stop sharing and then go back into it? If you would like to. Uh, okay. Thank you. I might, oh, Sorry about that. So I'm seeing you again, which is some relief because I'm talking into, into some blackness, which is a bit awkward. So, however, I'll probably have to go back to that screen now. And there's this other challenge now, hopefully that will work out. And uh, Sorry. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, no, I don't see anybody still, but anyway, I have to carry on. Uh, uh, we can't see the screen right now, just oh, to let you know. Oh. It's not being shared yet. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, my suggestion would be, uh, Manfred, please don't yeah. put it on slideshow. If you want to see us, then okay. just uh, let it be a normal PPT without the slideshow. Yeah. So. Oh, here we go. Is this? Can you see uh, this? Not no? yet. You, you've not started sharing a screen, have you? Second. And share your screen and then uh, click on um desktop yeah. right absolutely and let it be like this it's okay all right okay. yes so this way you can see us no, i still don't see you i'm afraid mm -hmm. you don't no uh no second but no. Mm -hmm. shruti i guess he needs to click on the view options that are up showing at the top on the view options yeah then, uh, some amendments there all right. My mistake, so, maybe it's something there. Why don't you uh, go to view and then maybe just uh, I'll just put side by side gallery. Click on side by side gallery up there. Mm. Then you will be able to see all of us. I don't see view. view. It it says um, mm -hmm. presenter view, slideshow. No. no, 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 not uh, not on this. Not it's, this view. This is a Zoom function I'm talking about. Okay. So this is there is one view section if you can see it there on top right, absolutely up there, of your no, not here, not here. Okay. Wait. Sorry, on the top right here. No. Yeah, no, not this one either. Uh, yeah. The one where it says you are sharing your screen right now in bright green. Yeah. Can you see a bright green? Next to that should be view options. Option. It doesn't give me another, I just. Yeah, just and um, no. so um, Dr. Stover Black says uh, that you should try the name Nananda, uh, what was that? Modus Gallery. Yeah, where do I do that? Sorry about that. Uh, in the view option. So at the very top, uh, you see the bright green line. Do you have a very bright green line on top of your screen that says you're sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah, I see that. And to right next to it, so on that level, there should be options. You are using enhanced encryption, it says. That's all I see. Mm -hmm. Interesting. A second. Uh, but that is where we're looking for the options, for the view options. Yeah. It uh, doesn't do anything for me there. Sorry. Um, then I think, I mean, we, uh, can, we can comfort you by saying that we will be there. We are listening attentively. <laughs> you, can, you can speak into the black hole. Uh, we empathize. We sympathize. Shruti, we have been doing this. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. uh, Shruti, I think you can share your screen and you can show uh, how to uh, go to that. You know, that way, maybe Professor uh, uh, would be. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to do that? I, I think, think, uh, I think uh, to, to simply I think demonstrate. We'll, we'll, I can go on if you are okay with yes, that. Yes, yes, please go it on, is, please go it's on. It's just for the one presenting a bit awkward. It's like in the theater, obviously, you want to have the audience, uh, which we don't have live anyway. We have the audience virtually, and this is a, another <laughs> complication. You don't see anybody on, uh, on the image. But I, I'll carry on a bit, yeah? So yes, okay. please do. We'll see how it goes, yeah? So I, I'll try to... Hmm? go through the slides a bit faster as well. So I'm talking here about further training. And so I, I, what I basically did is I went to Great Britain and enrolled in various courses and uh, did further training in drama and education. And then at Oldenburg University, uh, you know, I was a lecturer in German and English and was involved in teacher training. So I, I gave a lot of seminars on drama-based teaching of language, literature, and culture. I then also did, as from 1987 to 93, my PhD research, which was focused on Fremdsprache inszenieren. So that is 
a book which uh, is still referred to often and uh, in it I'm using this formula uh, teaching and learning with head, heart, hands, and feet. So the basic concept is the concept of holistic learning. And so I'm preparing the ground here through the book for also understanding teaching as a form of improvisation. An artist in Cork uh, one day had this uh, painting here. I kind of liked it. And uh, so he did that drawing and you see where the cap is there, no, there's a bit missing. And he says, the hat's not finished, but that's not my problem. So, I mean, just referring to the fact that sometimes as a teacher also, you need to go into situations and you're not fully prepared. At least you are not over prepared. You are taking risks, you are going in and you are willing to improvise. You, 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 you look at you know, what the situation around you is and you work with what you have, basically not in terms of the texts and handouts, but also what you have in terms of your experience of working with people. So basically, in that book, I'm arguing that performative uh, approaches can be used to teach all kinds of aspects of language, including grammar, speaking, listening, writing, reading, pronunciation, and so on. Then later on in the years uh, which followed, I focus very much on the teaching of literature. One example, for example, uh, is, is uh, the novel Zanzibar oder der letzte Grund by Alfred Anders. So there, there is a publication on, on the didactisierung eines Romans. So how we try to you know, work on the novel through drama. We use a lot of drama exercises to kind of you know, engage with the essence of this piece of literature. I was asked last year, as you can see here in 2020, to uh, write an article on the teaching of literature through drama. So in that article, I give an overview right from the start as to how I got into literature, how I gradually became a teacher of literature, and what made me believe in the power of performative approaches to literature. And now just to uh, yeah, change the format of today's lecture experience, I would like you to imagine something. It's an exercise I've been doing in a few contexts and apologies if there's one or two or three here who have gone through that exercise already. Uh, I'm taking the opportunity to say hello to Anke, for example, and to Sukesh. I saw a few more names up, some familiar names. So hello to you. So what, you, what I would ask you to do in a short while now is to write something into the chat. So it's basically that I'm asking you to improvise now to become active and do something. So the first step is that I ask you to imagine a situation. And then when I say, uh, you know, I would like you to respond spontaneously and write into that chat, if you don't mind. So this is an exercise will, which will take us, no? I don't know, up to five minutes maybe. <clears throat> okay, is that all right? Yes. Okay. Imagine you are at home in your living room or in your bedroom. You had a long day, maybe a lot of teaching, you're a bit tired, but uh, overall you're happy with the day, but you want to relax. Perhaps you're doing what you love doing. You just read your favorite book, or maybe you have a glass of wine. So perhaps you lie on your bed, 
perhaps you are sitting in an armchair. All of a sudden, the door opens and into the door comes a green dragon, a large green dragon. What would you do? Can you write this down spontaneously into the chat? Oh, this is fun. Gosh, I don't see anything. Okay. Hello? Okay. Yes, yes. Can we carry on? We're all there, yes. Okay, very good. Thank you for your wonderful responses. So, why this exercise? So, what I'm trying to do often in my teaching is to create situations which take students by surprise. So the overall thinking is as follows. Usually in our everyday lives, okay, when we are teaching with textbooks or whatever, when we travel to work and take the bus as usual and so on, we go through our routine experiences, unproblematic perception comes into play. But if we work with drama, through drama, what we are trying to do is to involve the senses, the feelings, the imagination. We are interested in aesthetic experiences. And so what needs to happen sometimes is that we bring in some little form of irritation so, and this is what I did here. I brought in a bit of irritation. So I did this uh, little exercise with students in core, with first year students. And these students, uh, yeah, wrote down their responses as you just did. And I give you a, a taste of their responses in a second. What I did also then was I asked, the I, I collected all the first year responses and I gave them to the second year students and I asked the second year students, could you please categorize the kind of responses? And so I give you a bit of a taste of what the students came up with. So student A wrote, I would try to talk diplomatically with the dragon, try to reason with it and make peace with it. So the second year students categorized it and, and said to be diplomatic, to try to reason. Student B, I'd keep on reading or working and ignore the dragon, 
because it didn't have the manners to knock on the door before entering. The dragon would eventually sense the angry vibes coming from me and after issuing a humble and heartfelt apology would leave the room and on this occasion adhere to the proper procedure necessary to gain admittance to the room. This was categorized as to be dismissive, ignorant, to expect norm to behavior or to be hostile even. Another student, I would tell the dragon that I was just about to put the kettle on and asked him if he could like, would like a cup of tea. Of course, he might not be able to drink it himself due to the fact that he doesn't actually possess hands with which to grasp the cup, but you, of course, would gladly assist. This was categorized as to be friendly, hospitable. And there are quite a few more. I won't go through all of them. So for example, one student uh, uh, took out a revolver and so on. And so the categorization was to use violence, be ruthless and so on. I just read you one which I found quite uh, impressive you know, by a first year student. And so it's a bit longer, but just to also say that in the spontaneous writing, this first year student was very creative, coming with, up with this within, let's say, three to five minutes. The dragon plodded in the door with a charming smile on its face. It sat down on the bed, curled its scaly tail around its big, green, clumpy feet and stared intensely at me. I was shivering like an aspen leaf from head to foot and offered my hand out to greet the dragon. The dragon looked anxiously at my outstretched hand, slowly still peering deep into my eyes, which were gaining its trust. It began to extend its own gnarled, scaly hand until it was parallel to my own. I gazed into the anxious eyes, knowing that the next move was in my court. Not wishing to distract the dragon with my quick movements and break the fragile thread of trust built on a stair, I slowly moved my hand closer to that of the dragon. Its penetrating eyes flickered momentarily and then the dragon's hand move to meet my own. Then the movement, the moment arrived, a meeting based on trust. Two hands, one gnarled and scaly, the other pink and smooth, clasped together, and both pairs of eyes seemed to shed a cloud of distrust. The second year students categorize this as to show courage to take a chance to risk physical contact. So I did this uh, exercise actually also in uh, modules which prepare students for the year abroad. And you, you can imagine what my agenda was there. So when you go abroad, you uh, will encounter the other. Things will be different. So how do we as human beings respond to that which is different? And just to create an awareness of the very many different forms of response which are possible. Okay, so, and just to add, I was inspired by a very short text by Franz Kafka, Der Grüne der Rache. So, talking about different cultures, so I think it was in 2018, I, uh, co-edited a book with John Crutchfield 
entitled Going Performative in Intercultural Education, Understanding Otherness, Differences, Other Cultures, is very much the focus of this publication. Um, what are the differences between, for example, German culture and Indian culture? I mean, in your departments, you will probably talk about that a lot. And uh, how can one get to the root of these differences? But also, what do we share? It's a very big topic, I suppose. I've, I mentioned my visit to Bangalore. So that was, I think, um, probably around 10 years ago. I was in my accommodation, and in the morning, I, I read in an Indian paper an article which I found very interesting. So just before I show you the article, um, when you work through drama and when you work in the field of theater, you often you know, get involved in theater games. So there's kind of you know, a lot of games which are very familiar. And uh, this article made me aware that there might be a very different perception of how useful these games actually are. I mean, many theater pedagogues would take certain games and the value of them for granted, but there are different perspectives, obviously. And I found this Indian take on a game which is very common in the Western context, interesting. I let you read this yourselves. Uh, now it would actually be helpful to have a full screen presentation. Okay, sorry. No problem. Mm, how do we do that? Slideshow. Better? Thank you, yes. yes. To get through it. Okay. If you got uh, the basic idea, so there are quite a number of games which you would play and in a theater pedagogical context. And they are kind of often quite a lot of fun. 
and you innocently become involved in those games and maybe sometimes also for the right reason. And, uh, but I, I just found this perspective interesting. So do certain games, I guess, uh, what is it? Just emphasize competition too much. Is there different ways of doing things? That's a big discussion, which we can't uh, enter into in a big way here today, but uh, I would find it very interesting to pursue this uh, further. This is one of the things I think no, I would be very interested in. By the way, I managed to see a few of you again. So I see three, four, five slides on my right. This is very reassuring. I'm back hmm, with you, sort of, on some level. Hmm. Okay, so I carry on. Now, as I said hmm, at the beginning, what do we understand by the term performative? Hmm? And hmm, so I carry on with that a little bit. So before I go into the definition of the performative, just in very general terms, what kind of work are we today doing in the uh, language education world? So we distinguish there, or that was my suggestion a few years ago, between large scale forms and small scale forms. So what are large scale forms? So reference here, at your conference was made already a few times to staging a play. So you, you have a script and uh, on the base of the script, you just perform the play or you make up the play yourself, which is referred to often as devised here. So these are very standard practices in departments. And uh, the thing to bear in mind is it's obviously very time consuming. So you need several weeks for hmm, putting on a play. And it often means that you have to do it uh, in an extracurricular way. So uh, we can't deal with all the large scale forms here. I just point to theater and education projects there. I will show you slides relating to those. And I'm pointing to dramatic cultural transfer projects. So I'll give you an example of that as well. So there are other projects which just take quite a bit of time. And as I say, can be realized often only in an extracurricular fashion. So this is an example of a theater and education project I was involved in in 1984. So you see this dated poster today with computer technology, you would things do things uh, very different. But the basic idea here, you see Ireland with Great Britain on its back. So the play was very much on colonialism. So, and what we tried to do so that is a group from Ireland. I was involved in the project together with eight or nine others. And we traveled through Germany for two months and we performed this play in schools. And it was part of you know, the English language teaching program in the schools. So basically theater and education at the time meant for us that weeks before we visited the schools, we would send the teachers you know, teaching materials so they could prepare you know, this kind of topic we would look at in the play from various perspectives. Then we came in with the performance and after the performance, we did workshops with the students. So this actually was for me really a very, very important experience personally, especially working with these students after our performance. So students working with actors, the, 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 the kind of energy that was generated in the classrooms did excite me and actually finally made it that I wanted to pursue this further and to, and to devote my research to it. So here you can see 
And this was an article in the Irish Times. And uh, there was another project we did in 86. As you can see here, we reached out to a lot of students. So we performed this play to 17,000 West German school children at the time. So one of the uh, very important experiences for me. I'm moving on to another project I was involved in, another large scale project. The world, okay, is actually a character in that play. I, I just give you the background very briefly. Earlier on, I showed you a slide by Calderon de la Barca, and he wrote a play, The Great Theater of the World. And this play was written in 1636. And there is a village in Switzerland, Einsiedeln. And in Einsiedeln, they put on uh, this play for many years in that community of Einsiedeln. And the impressive uh, aspect for me was when I saw the play performed in Einsiedeln in Switzerland, that 500 you know, um, citizens became involved in the project as amateur performers. So it was highly impressive and so impressive that I thought this needs to be made known in Ireland as well. So what is this though? It's the, the citizens of Einsiedeln decided they had put on the Calderon de la Barca play for so many years in the traditional format. At some stage they said though, we will ask a well-known Swiss playwright and ask him to write an adaptation. Thomas Hürlimann, the Swiss playwright, wrote that adaptation and his play is the one I then worked on with a colleague from the Spanish department. We translated the play and brought it to performance as well. So cultural transfer project means basically, so you look at hmm, a play which was hmm, written in, in a, another cultural context and you try to transfer it to another culture. So in this case from, first of all, Spanish Baroque culture to Swiss culture, from Swiss culture to Irish culture. So the translation had lots of challenges. And uh, I just show you a few images here. So you see the character of the world on stage in the Aula in University College Cork. The play is very much, the adaptation is very much on climate change. And uh, there are seven scenes in the play. And throughout the play, the end wind becomes stronger and stronger. And so the play seemingly is a bit of an apocalyptic vision of our world should we not be able to get control over what we do with the climate. Um, sorry to interrupt Professor yeah. Shaver, but uh, would we finish in 10 minutes so that there's some time for questions? Okay, we'll, thank you. Hmm? So, thank you. Thank you. Little World hmm, appears as well in the play. So the new generations aspect. Little World encouraging the world to keep on turning. So these are just some visual impressions of this large scale project. So these are the large scale forms. Then there are the small scale forms which are of interest to teachers of a language. So meaning basically that as a language teacher, you need a, I guess, a bit of a toolbox. You need to be familiar with the dramatic techniques so you need to know what a still image is, you know, or how to do mime, et cetera, et cetera. So then you can use these in order 
to create learning experiences which will facilitate language learning in different ways. In the journal we are editing scenario, you will, you will find many, many examples of what can be done with these small scale forms in various cultural contexts at various levels of education. So just to say as well, that there is a continuum between small scale and large scale. So you can begin with something very small, for example, a still image, and that can grow into, give you the basic idea for the development of a performance. So, yeah, what I've been doing since 2003, I've been trying to build an international network and uh, of researchers and practitioners. We had a conference in 2003 that was a bit of a starting point. And at that conference, the, the idea came up to also uh, found a journal at some stage. We founded that journal in 2007. And the scenario project I'm involved in has these different pillars here, if you like, the journal, the book series, the forum is the, the lively one. And uh, Shruti mentioned it earlier. We are doing a regular colloquium, for example. We host symposia and conferences. And uh, just to mention the correspondence initiative, we have uh, correspondents in different countries who report on performative uh, teaching and learning in their institutions in their different cultural contexts. So what we are trying to do is this, basically promote intercultural dialogue in the area of drama and theater pedagogy to pave the way towards a performative teaching and learning culture. So I guess here on our web pages, you will also find links to films, for example, of the conferences. I can't show any of that now. I just want to briefly, though, go into the meaning of the word performative, as it has come up so often. So in volume three of our book series, Susanne Even myself, we reflect on performative teaching, learning, research. Various colleagues have contributed to that volume who is interested, whoever is interested will find more information in there. So just to go through the performative quickly. So in the word performative, you have the word form. So what we are trying to do in our teaching is to emphasize form, aesthetic form. So the word also contains the element formative so there's an emphasis on development, on growth. So personal development is very much involved. And just to give you an example, so in Goethe's writings, you find an example of theater's powerful educational impact. Uh, maybe you can read this later on, but it's an interesting quote from Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre. You see here that theater helps Wilhelm Meister to increase his, uh, what is it, skills in public speaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'll skip that here for time reasons. So performative, the basic meaning is certainly is a, that there's an emphasis on doing, on creative doing. So. Another aspect, performing arts versus performative arts. The term performative arts is wider than performing arts and includes all arts disciplines which focus on creative doing. The question we discussed at a symposium in Hanover a few years ago, which school university subject can potentially develop into a performative subject discipline? For example, history, mathematics. So open for discussion. At the 
symposium in Hanover, we came up with different recommendations for the promoting of a performative teaching, learning and research culture in higher education. You can find the information um, under that link, which will be shared with you later on. So I'll skip. So this is some brainstorming here, basic brainstorming. What does performative really suggest? What's what, you know, what kind of connotations come up? And uh, so more recently, together with Erika Fischer-Lichte, we have made this a bit more accessible here. And uh, I can't go through all of this again, but let's start at P, for example. P could stand for presence. So the teacher, for example, is in a state of heightened receptivity and enabling someone to think on his or her feet and act spontaneously. So embodiment, reflection, and so on. I know it's a bit rushed now. I'm sorry, but it's for time reasons. So the international picture what kind of developments are presently taking place? How can scenario kind of you know, get engaged with the international discussions? Here's one example, which was kind of born in a Berlin context. Currently work is uh, going on on the development, with regard to the development of a performative arts and pedagogy international glossary. And uh, there have been reports on this project in a scenario. Here, I made an attempt to see if the word performative works in different languages. And so the idea is to use performative as an umbrella term for all kinds of uh, activities which are theater and drama related. And as an international term, it seems to be working fine if you look at this list, Italian, French, and so on. Just in terms of research on, on the impact of performative teaching and learning. So there has been an, a European project and uh, which has looked at the effectiveness of this kind of work. I let you read these few sentences for yourselves. Yeah, ideally we would have more time. There's also neuroscientific evidence for this effectiveness. And uh, Michaela Zambanis at the Freie Universität Berlin has written on the effectiveness of drama a lot. So just to slowly come towards the end of the presentation, so what is performative teaching and learning all about? So I refer to teacher training as a wissenschaftliche Ausbildung. So that's how we know teacher training. So my point is we need to bring art more into teacher training. We need to embrace theory, but also we need to embrace practice more. The doing, the creative doing needs to be emphasized more in the training of teachers and language teachers. So in that training, we have our standard reference disciplines, which is you know, Literaturwissenschaft, Literature Studies, or you know, Sprachwissenschaft, Linguistics, and so on. But you know, we need to embrace more these arts-based disciplines, for example, Theaterwissenschaft, Theater Science. <clears throat> and certainly we need to look, especially at the field of theater practice, 
how do the professionals work in the field of theater practice? What can we learn from them? So there are different art subjects in schools often, music and so on, visual art. Why not work together with them and begin to embrace the aesthetic dimension of teaching and learning more? So we could discuss this further had we more time. More recently, I offered this overview in the German language for those who are in German departments maybe later on to, to, to look at. And uh, just to say, whoever as a teacher um, would like to work performatively, I think hmm, what would help an awful lot if the person had knowledge, that is, was familiar with aesthetic theory to an extent, but especially is familiar with forms of creative doing, that is aesthetic practice. So sound, voice, image, movement, space, embodied action, all of that is of importance if you want to see yourself more and more as an artist, as a teacher. Okay, Let's see, how are we going? Here again, the idea of a continuum, a foreign language teacher obviously is trained as a, as a pedagogue, but hmm, there is hmm, development possible and hmm, he can become more and more of an artist. Just to conclude with, this was referred to earlier on. So a more recent publication of mine is this one. Uh, so on the softening of our world, 81 sayings, it's an attempt to respond creatively to the pandemic, the worldwide pandemic. So there are lots of creative contributions in this book. And uh, yeah, it was sparked off actually by a poem uh, by Bertolt Brecht and you know, three lines from his poem yeah, were the inspiration for those who contributed to the book. And there are very different perspectives in there. So if you're interested, it would be wonderful to hear back from you and see what you think. In case you have an interest in joining the Scenario Forum, here are the details. And I think I then now slowly come to the end. Thank you for your uh, participation and also your patience and I hope I will see images of you once I stop sharing the screen and then we can enter into a discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. The bibliography will be made accessible later on so just to <clears throat> say that's there but this is Irish for the end. Thank you so much, Professor Sheva. It was absolutely wonderful, delightful. The journey you took us through your personal journey as well as the international journey of drama pedagogic, as it were, how important drama is in an education, in a holistic kind of an education. And so I'm not going to be asking any questions. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me see if people have asked questions already. Yes, there is one question. Professor Sheva, do you see the question or should I read it out to you from Aarti? Just going into the chat there from... Um, Aarti? <clears throat> um, All right. Okay. Literature through drama. Okay. Yeah. I see it as not reading of drama in the literature classroom, but surely at the performative way of approaching literature. Could you elaborate on it more? We can enact the drama, but how does performative work in the context of other literary forms of writings besides plays and so on? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> I think in principle, you can work on all kinds of literary texts by 
using dramatic techniques. You can work on a poem, for example. So it hasn't uh, been very much the tradition in the German educational system for uh, many decades, for example, to learn poems off by heart. So I personally quite like that. So, and I could uh, come up with a few poems. If you have time, I can entertain you with a few. For example, als er 70 war und war gebrechlich, drängte es den Lehrer doch nach Ruhe. Denn die Güte war im Lande wieder einmal schwächlich und die Bosheit nahm an Kräften wieder einmal zu und er gürtete den Schuh. Und er nahm mit, was er so brauchte. Wenig. Es wurde dies und das. And so on and so on. This poem has 13 stanzas. And that's the very poem I was fascinated by and which was the inspiration for the book I just referred to, the 81 Saints. So reciting, how to do it, working in the space. So use that text and not only read it, not only analyze it, but you know, bring it to life. And once you do that, once you learn it of yourself, and uh, you, you develop a much deeper relationship to the text. And this happens to me again and again, when I learn a poem, that after time, so after my various attempts, maybe 10, 20, 25 times, all of a sudden, I see details in the text, which I otherwise would never have seen. So that's uh, one answer using the, uh, the, the, the yeah, yeah, go, uh, re referring to poems. So I mentioned um, working on a, on a novel, for example, so what, what did we do at the time with that novel? So the novel is uh, fairly long. So we decided we would make it more accessible for learners of German. So we cut out a few bits. So obviously there can be a question mark over that, you know, should that be done or not? But then we were thinking very much in a you know, pedagogical way, yeah, maybe we just need to help these learners of German whose level isn't you know, that high yet. So um, and then we focused, for example, on uh, um, yeah, the content obviously, and in this case, a sculpture by an artist, Ernst Barlach, plays an important role. So a simple thing we did then was, we asked the students to you know, look at the image of a sculpture and we asked students simply to, to you know, take up a position like hmm, the person in that sculpture and then try to really get a feel for how the person sits and what might happen inside while the person is sitting there like uh, he, he does. And uh, so they then came up with very interesting hmm, written responses after the exercise. So that's uh, just one example. What we did uh, in that uh, didactisierung, as we would say in German as well. For example, we said, okay, this particular character, what do you think? What would he or she dream of? Would she have some sort of a nightmare possibly, considering what had happened in the novel at a certain point in the novel? And then we asked them to just yeah, come up with a creative response and to, to, to basically write a scenario for that dream and then perform that dream. So you can do simple things like that and they don't take up so much time of your lesson. So let's say the sculpture exercise could have taken you half an hour. 
the dream exercise, okay, you can extend it, hmm? it can be very spontaneous too. So it could take up hmm, 20 to 40 minutes maybe. So those are hmm, two examples. So what other genres? So working on plays, obviously there are many things you can do there. But maybe if there's another question, we move on. Is there another one? Yes, yes. There are a couple of more here. Weidemann had a question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your talk, which was uh, very insightful and wide, even if we didn't have so much time uh, to go into details in the end. Um, yeah. I was thinking of something you said uh, in the first half of the talk, uh, which I found uh, uh, very central to our topic, namely the irritation that uh, we introduce by exposing uh, both native students of a particular place, but also uh, foreign students as uh, uh, foreign language learners to uh, very problematic um, things that happen, very problematic events, war, death, rape, uh, everything that you have in uh, literature in the widest sense. Um, and in the current situation, in the current atmosphere with uh, trigger warnings in some uh, parts of the Western world being required at universities, this is actually not so much my concern because these are still very open environments in spite of uh, these changes. But if, you, if we look at more restrictive situations uh, by either politics in a particular country or just by the culture in a particular country where you're dealing with taboos. Um, how do you deal with uh, uh, these kinds of limits that you must have also come across even just within Ireland uh, uh, or the wider European context? As a former DAD lecturer, I uh, ask you this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a very... Uh, sensitive topic, I suppose. So we are dealing with different cultures in this world. We have different understandings. We have different ways of seeing the world. So we have democratic systems. We have non-democratic systems. We have all kinds of different religions. So what can you try and do? So my main concern always has been to really um, try and be in tune with the group I have, you know, to, to, to be aware of you know, the fact that they are from different backgrounds. You know. And I remember I worked at uh, Oldenburg University and I taught these courses for students from other countries, from Africa and from all over the world. You know. So very much a multicultural setting. So my aim basically was to create situations in which they could bring in some sort of a perspective from their own culture. So I can't give you offhand here a very concrete example, but uh, so um, just thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, for example, I mean, I remember there was somebody in a group from Sudan in Africa. So personally, my knowledge of Sudan, Africa was pretty much zero. I don't know what the living conditions there are there and how people live their everyday lives and so on. So what we maybe did was to show different scenarios of no, life in a street in a city in Sudan as a, compared to life in a city in Paris and so on and so on. Yeah? And so when you have these perspectives and then compare them, you begin a discussion with the whole group on, gosh, no, I didn't know that, no, that this was the case in Sudan and so on. So I think what uh, I was always interested in, was to foster the curiosity of students with regard to what is happening in the other cultural context. Because what is the matter with most of us is we have knowledge which we have through the media. And how trustworthy is that knowledge which is transported through the media? So obviously I can't claim to have 
first-hand knowledge of 50 or 100 countries, and there are so many countries in this world. Hmm? So maybe I've been in, one, in two or three or four where I could say, yeah, I know the situation there a little bit better and might even know a bit of the language. Hmm? But it's all about learning, learning more about the other cultures. And when you begin to learn more, when you have learned more, you're also more competent uh, with regard to interacting with people from these different places and to be on a kind of a level with them, sort of. Again, very wide, no? Jan Helge, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. I think I think I, I get the main thrust of your of your response also to be context aware, to have a safe space in the classroom, um, things like this. So yes, I get it. Thank you. Ruti mm -hmm. had a question. And then uh, Raju had a bemakung. Um, thank you so much, Professor Shiva. This is um, that it, it was really insightful just to get to know you even better, though we meet so often. But really, I mean, to get to know your entire career, it was really wonderful to know. Um, uh, a really important and, and precious piece of information for for all all of us to know you, to get to know you that way. Mm, my concern is, I mean, of course, there are so many creative ideas. And um, since I've been practicing uh, with my students, and this is what we are also going to see tomorrow, um, my concern has been uh, the online platform. Mm. And uh, I have tried to find answers there. And I'd, I'd really love it when we discuss it tomorrow, once we've actually you know, talked about it. Uh, questions uh, such as um, the, that of Aarti, for example, I have also tried to find a certain solution there. But otherwise, what kind of work is being done in, in this area, online performance and in, in, in online classroom, online foreign language learning? So if this is a question for me. I mean, as you have seen today, I failed miserably with the technology. So I'm, I'm not an IT wizard and need to confess. So I haven't been involved in many projects now where we engage with what can we do in the virtual space. However, what I'm trying to do is to encourage younger colleagues and Shruti, you have come across uh, Dragan and uh, uh, Fion, yeah, for example. So they have been more active on that front and uh, have uh, quite a lot to offer there, I would say. And uh, just to mention, they will be hosting a special symposium in the summer. And I think the call for papers for that is still up. So in case anybody is interested, so that would be a forum where you just engage exactly with that question. And so the hope is that, I mean, because it's kind of a new experience for so many colleagues, so and um, there's a need to discuss this more. And that's the whole idea to do that in June, I think it is at some stage. Yeah? So get, do I get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, for the time being, yes. <laughs> Raju, you wanted to say something? Um, no, I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Shaver for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And maybe just share um, uh, one experience, because we were talking about how performance and acting can be meaningfully used in other disciplines, other areas, and so on. And I find that uh, uh, beginners, uh, uh, you know, uh, the learners at the beginning stage of a foreign language also tend to want to translate uh, texts into, into their own languages, into their own languages. Mm -hmm. And there I find, and later on, you know, because I have been also doing a little bit of literary translation from German into Marathi and vice versa and so on. And I find it is extraordinarily helpful for me to read a text aloud, to enact it for myself, you know, in my own space, in order to get to know this space of uh, feelings and, and emotions and so on. So it is not just the word that I'm translating, but it is, you know, how I understand uh, um, the feelings and emotions that uh, uh, in short, shorter text, perhaps as exercises to begin with, 
and then one can go on to uh, larger projects as you were saying the small scale and the large scale and so on so just wanted to share that yeah i fully agree and uh, uh, just recently i was involved in a bit of translation it's a, it's a very challenging job to 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 arrive at a really good you know, fitting translation and what you describe you know, professor dengle is just it you know? so to engage with the text to come to become a personal friend of that text basically and the other way around and then you have it maybe and then you've come to the essence of it and then you can come up with a good translation um i saw three raised hands milan ekta and anjali was was i correct because now i don't see them anymore <clears throat> so it wasn't that order uh, milan yes milan is asking a question and ekta and anjali if you wanted to ask you can go after milan <clears throat> thanks madhu and thank you professor shaver that was a that was a beautiful journey that you took us through and uh, uh, i i just want to do i just had a thing to share which actually has been uh, has come to my mind after i heard yan helger's question in the beginning and uh, madhu knows uh, we had we have had a colleague matachan who did a very interesting uh, phd where he took stock of the situation of germanistic in india in his phd and uh, and he he came up with with the uh, with the idea that the that the goal of um, of foreign language pedagogy uh, should actually be a transcultural or uh, the paradigm is transcultural and not intercultural i think that that's uh, when talk, listening to you talking about going performative i feel that it is also uh, something that so you you kind of internalize the other the 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 fremde and in that sense you become you're not like saying that this is my culture and now i'm going to uh, learn a bit about the other culture but it is something that comes together in you and it it actually is is transforms you into into something something different so i i just uh, felt that uh, in the context of this webinar i think uh, the idea of uh, the transcultural which uh, which uh, matachan has worked on i think that is also important just wanted to say that and this was uh, this i thought of uh, as i was listening to jan helga ask his questions so i just wanted to uh, say that thank you Thank you very much. It reminds me maybe of the German term coined by Goethe. I think Weltbürger as well. And I just got hold of a little compendium by Erasmus from Rotterdam. He is also talking of himself being a Weltbürger. He doesn't want to be Dutch or German or whatever he. sees things in a larger context so maybe that fits in there a bit thank you thank you uh ekta did you want to ask a question oh madhu i had a question i guess anjali that's what i was saying i saw your hand <laughs> raised and then it was not raised anymore okay yeah that's I, that's good <laughs> um actually um not a question but it's quite kind of late so i just wanted to know as a very naive person who has never done anything like what all of you do uh, just as a language teacher when can we really start with something like this like in the learning stage like um, shruti students even in the first year they are doing all this so my i was wondering when can uh, a teacher start Uh, include including these kind of activities where uh, because in the in the initial stages when students don't really know the language and they are uh, not ready to memorize things also like learning by heart is not easy for everyone mm -hmm. so uh, when at the earliest can we start something like this well basically you can start at any 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 point i think so you can use these uh, techniques also for beginners and there are various articles focusing on how you work with beginners there's actually also a what is it a specific way of working called psychodramaturgy and uh, they begin by introducing the students to the sounds of the foreign language first so students listen to the sounds don't understand the meaning much just go with the feel of the sound and get involved in creative work and so gradually move like 
children, like babies, slowly get into that foreign language. So I just can say, I think in scenario, there are probably a few articles on how to work with beginners. So it's in principle possible at any stage, at any level. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Just, I just wanted to add to this, you know, Anjali, the first part of your question was very interesting and in fact more crucial, I think, for our discussion here. As you said, as someone who is not like the rest of you, I think that's very important. You know, it is my understanding of myself, whether I am an artist or not. Actually, that is the first step. That is the first stage of Yuba Vindu. Exactly. Um, I think it's after that that the students come. You know, I think that's, it's, it's so important. I wouldn't have done performance on the first day. I was very awkward for me. It was really awkward, you know, to put up that. It was just, just, just because my students have been doing it. I said, I have to do something too. You know, just, just, yeah. I don't know, just to overcome our own inhibitions. I think we need to do that. That's really num step number one for me uh, and for, for anyone, I guess, as a teacher of foreign language. Yes. Shruti, may I add something to it? Yes. Uh, Who is that? Gitanjali. This is Gitanjali uh, from St. Xavier's School, Pune. So uh, this year I tried uh, theater for the six standards and also for the seven standards. And they did it so well. You know, it was a competition by Forum Deutsch and they even got one prize. So it was like so much. Um, excitement for the children and as well as for me because it was a trial for me because they have been learning German only uh, for about an year or so and that too online so first thing that I introduced them German was online and even then they could uh, you know get it so well uh, if you all are interested I can even send you the links and you can just have um, you know uh, a look at the theater uh, what we put up so, I mean, any point of time you can just start. And being children, they learned it so well and so quickly that everyone was so just aghast. Like, how come they know German so well? I mean, it sounded like they have been learning German since first standard or so. So that was really a great experience to me as well as a teacher to grow and even for my children. Because now they have, um, you know, a special liking for this subject not uh, just uh, as an academic subject, but also as an extracurricular activity subject. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great, very impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you would like to um, have the links, I can post the links here and then you, you all can watch them later whenever you're free. I can sure. probably post the prize winner list, I mean, the link, not both the place. Uh, Actually, both the place. Why don't, you, why don't you send me the links uh, at my yes. email address? Sure. You have yes. the poster, right? And then I can share it with everyone. So tomorrow I'm going to also cool. circulate a Google form and I'm going to ask all of you to give me a feedback. So there I have your email addresses and then I can send you all the material. Uh, Professor Shiva's um, uh, presentation, all the other information that you require and also the, the purpose would be to keep in touch after this, just in yes. case we do something like yeah. this again, you know, so we can do that, right? Have you yes, posted it's, your email address? Yes, it's in the poster, right? It's in the poster that you must have um, okay. referred to. Yes. Uh, I'm so sorry. Right. I don't have the poster. All right. Just so, share your email address here. I'm sharing my email address here. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. All right. So thank you so much. I would like to then um, really thank Professor Shaver for this lovely, lovely, lovely and engaging um uh, paper, it has really been an honor to have you here with us. Really? And uh, I want to thank Professor Madhusani for having chaired this session and having in, had engaged us, you know, all this has been so, so, so nice, really. Um, and having said that, this is already kind of as hat ja schon Appetit auf die morgigen Studentenaufführungen gemacht. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to start with the students' performances. We have already started and we are already, you know, kind of um, thinking in on those lines. Anjali's question was so pertinent. I have tried to do some experiments. Uh, I want to try to show, I mean, show, etc. And, and also 
um, you know, basically it's been a big experiment for me as well. So the question that I put to you, Professor Shiva, it was a big question mark. And let's see, I mean, how far we've really been able to do um, justice to this platform also. Thank you so much to everyone who uh, joined me here. Professor Dengle, Madhu, Prachi, Ritwik, Jan Helge, thank you for being the facilitator, by the way. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Namaste. Aparna, thank you. just please. Could I add thank a thank you, thank in you so much. Shruti, word yes. in edgeways. Just that I want to pay my regards to Professor Dengle, Madhu, yeah, and Milin, who's my <laughs> senior. The, the others have taught me yeah, 30 years ago. <laughs> Thank so you so yes, much. Uh, thanks, to, thanks to the coronavirus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that that we could, I could see you all, uh, like, at least in person, virtually. Lovely yeah. to see you all. Yeah. And, and very, very informative. And since I have had some brush with theatre myself, so I would like to tell Professor Shweda that, uh, and also to Anjali, that I tried it, you can try it from the day one, in fact. Yeah. It works with them, with songs, with anything that's catchy, and they will catch up. And they'll get the intonation also right, even if they don't understand a fig. Right? That's, that works. It works. That's, yeah. that's Thank you so much, yeah. Professor Shwe and Shruti, for um, giving us this opportunity. I'm sorry it's, I couldn't it's, log it's in yesterday. It's lovely to have all of you here. And, and um, uh, uh, Dr. Ankish Ishtova uh, Black, would you please also just, um, again, just um, switch on your camera. You know, I, 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 can I just call you Anke? It's a, you've got a little, it's a long surname, right? Can I just call you Anke? Is it okay? Hi, Anke. So Anke, by the way, all of you should know, Tushar Choudhury, our Tushar, is now working at Hanover, and Anke is, is his colleague. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and Anke is also working, has been uh, uh, associated with the Stereo Forum and with Professor Shaver for a long time. <laughs> and yes, what a, what a coincidence. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm just really, really happy to have you here, Anke. It's even more. Tusha will be my follower. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope, I hope his, his interest in uh, drama pedagogy will, will rise. I hope so. <laughs> yes. And he's going to teach you some, some online elements too. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. The digital. <laughs> yeah, just All right. Add. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. And uh, I take your leave now. Maybe can I just say, yes. take the yes, opportunity to, to, to mention that that Anke is specializing on working on poems. She has done very interesting work on you know, using drama techniques on poems. So just for those of you who are in German departments, uh, her dissertation is in German and I highly recommend that one. For example. And I just take the opportunity to thank you all. It has been a wonderful afternoon for me, evening for you, I think. So it's... Uh, a great, I take uh, uh, Professor Millen's uh, word on board. There's been a great transcultural experience. So uh, engaging with all of you uh, has enriched my day and uh, maybe we will have further opportunities in the future and maybe some I will see in the scenario context or at other you know, very engaging events in your university. This one looks so promising. I'm very impressed and I congratulate all those who were involved, are involved and all the very best for tomorrow as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shruti. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Oh. Cheers. Happy Holi. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Shruti, can I have your email, please? Yes, yes.